Attendees can't see you yet. I think we are live. We are live. Yeah, it looks like. Uh, uh, so, yes, I would imagine. Yes, attendees are now coming, I think. I see Andrew has joined. Uh, so, there's okay. a count at the right upper right corner. Now it's eight. Yes, yes, I can see this now. All right. Um, so I guess we can we can start the conversation, or shall we? So that um, and the comments as well. I I see there's a uh, Andrew that Ray. Okay, so um, gentlemen, if that's okay with you, I, I guess uh, we can uh, we can start and. Uh, uh, I Im would imagine more uh, more attendees will come our way. So shall we? Shall we kick it off? Yes. All right. So well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are, and good night. In case uh, you're doing this in the middle of the night and uh, uh, you decided to join us for this parallel session, um, name is Mark Esposito. I I'm uh, moderating this panel uh, on development of new tech in the COVID world. Um, this is a topic that I guess has become popular in many parts of the world, primarily because um, technology has been one of the largest, uh, if not most discussed protagonists of uh, the crisis beside the most obvious uh, public health issues and uh, uh, the concern about the economy. And, and uh, one of the conversations that we're going to have today is how in this integration with the new normals, as they call it, um, we'll see more and more uh, possibilities, um, opportunity for technology to become uh, a, a form of augmented performance, um, ability to reassess our systems, and of why not uh, even looking at a possible renaissance in terms of that building foundations for um, a different uh, set of um, uh, imperatives, of course, a number a number of opportunity that will come from a reform way of doing business, and uh, you know the navigation of a system that seems to look um, asymmetrical, and it seems to be asymmetrical for the years to come. So, so like lost a bit of the sense of convergence we used to have, and we're now looking at something a little bit more K-shaped, as they call it. Uh, today with me, um, a number of uh, esteemed colleagues uh, are joining us, and I would like to uh, provide you a little bit with uh, um, just a quick intro, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, set up a bit of a format and a conversation. So uh, joining me, uh, there is uh, uh, Harry Hui, founder and managing partner of Clearview Partners. And um, Harry, I'm not sure where you're calling from. Where is uh, where are you calling us from today? I'm in Shanghai. Shanghai. Okay. Good morning. So, so for you, it's like uh, um, afternoon, right? Early yeah. afternoon, right? Yeah. Then we have in uh, Shin Ito, Chief Executive Officer of uh, Ecoyo. Yes. Uh, is it, yeah. Where are you calling us from, Shin? I'm calling from Tokyo. It's 3 p.m. From oh. Tokyo, so we're shifting a bit, a little bit uh, again in the afternoon. Uh, then I have in Klaus Neumann, which is Senior Vice President of Fast Growth Market Strategy at the SAP. Klaus, welcome. Hi. Hello. Hi. Nice to be here. I'm also in yeah. Shanghai, as you probably can see. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's not a virtual background, Klaus. So, so <laughs> <laughs> we know it. that's Shanghai. Okay, great. Um, we see uh, Xiao in, uh, I hope, Q or Q, uh, Q. founder of Round of Q. Q. So, uh, Xiao Hin, uh, you're the founder of Around the World. Where are you calling us from? Uh, I'm in Mountain View, California. Um, you're in California, so for you, it's uh, it's night, right? Yes, uh, it's yeah. 11 p.m., yeah. 11 p.m., right. And finally, Andrew Bate, which is a chief executive officer of, of Safely. Andrew, where are you uh, calling? I'm in Atlanta, from? so I'm like smack in the middle of the night. You're <laughs> smack two, in the middle of the night. All mm -hmm. right, well, then I should tell you that I'm calling in from Dubai because <laughs> uh, we were we were missing the Middle East right in this conversation, and for me it's like ten in the morning. Right. So we we really are going from the West Coast to mainly the East um, to uh, Middle East, and of course we have uh, 
a group of you cluster in Asia between Shanghai and Tokyo. It was fascinating. So maybe, um, maybe uh, Harry, I'll start with you. Um, I'll ask you maybe guys to spend uh, two, three minutes on some opening remarks on how you see um, technology and COVID been integrated into uh, what you see rising as the new normals. Um, how do you see opportunities? If you can share some of the observations, we'll try to round on um, a first uh, round of contribution from each one of you so that we're collecting that experiences. And we'll use, this, we'll use the second part of the conversation maybe to discuss, to have uh, chit chats on this and see in which way we can uh, create value for our viewers. So Harry. Yeah, good morning, good evening, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here, a lot of experts on the call. So I look forward to a good session of mutual learning and discussions. Uh, so maybe uh, I'll just make three quick points. The first thing is that, uh, as everybody knows, uh, China was really uh, the first in, first out in the FIFO market amongst all of the industrialized nations that uh, undergone the uh, COVID pandemic. So uh, just a quick update is that uh, everything is kind of back to normal, back to business in Shanghai. Schools have reopened, Disney's reopened, factories, supply chains have all been pretty much back to normal. The capital markets are kind of on fire. The A-share market is really doing very well. And uh, there are a number of IPOs coming from Chinese companies going public. In fact, it's up almost 30, 40% year on year. So in many regards, um, uh, China is going through a, um, a unique uh, in asymmetrical situation. Uh, we're in the private equity business. Uh, Clearview Partners is a firm we started about 10 years ago, and we invest in the consumer sector. And uh, so um, approximately about $9 billion, um, in, um in revenue a year, and we employ about 92,000 employees and a total market cap of about $30 billion U.S. dollars. So it's from this perspective that I wanted to share some takeaways and insights on what we have observed about the impact on technology uh, during the COVID and also going forward. Um, so the first thing um, we would say and we have learned and observed is that you could bucket that uh, the impact of the business of COVID on the economy, you could largely bucket them into four different groups. The first group of business really boomed and accelerated and benefited and they're not coming back. So they boomed and they continue to do well. The second group of companies have really boomed and then stabilized and revert to what they were prior and then the third group is undergoing a V-shape, and the last group is undergoing a U-shape. So when you categorize the businesses, that's really largely what we are seeing as the four types of company. But um, specifically, what did we see? We saw that um, um, on a headline basis, I think the online habits have probably accelerated by a factor of one to two years. So the leapfrogging of the anything that was an online experiment uh, an experience, whether it be in education, healthcare, uh, et cetera, we saw an acceleration of its adoption and habits by about one to two years. The second thing that we saw is probably that um, organizationally, companies that had traditional hierarchical organizations had to be much more flat and more nimble and more flexible to compete and evolve. Um, so that was uh, the second point. And then uh, finally, the last point is uh, it's been the strangest year with everything that's going on, and particularly in China, between the U.S. and China, having the tension that it is, we're seeing more and more of a decoupling, uh, obviously. Um, and in a way, that decoupling is leading to a Sputnik moment for China. Uh, it's a moment where I think uh, the, 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 the Chinese government, the entrepreneurs and so forth are realizing they're going to need to invest heavily into fulfilling some of the weaknesses in their supply chain and technology gap. So it is very much a Sputnik moment and, um, and where that will go uh, as investors, uh, we're going to keep looking for opportunities. So, Mark, those are my opening comments and uh, over right. back. You know, Harry, this is this is a, a great way for us to start. Um, also, having a, a deep dive into what you sense has been the reaction that the Chinese market had, especially now, because as we mentioned before, uh, such an asymmetrical performance where a country like China might feel that there is a sense of normalcy that has been regained with some coefficient of acceleration, or the market are still uh, really struggling with thinking about. Uh, where we're heading and how to eventually get to a point where China is. So that's very interesting. Um, I'll try to uh, ping pong it now. We're going with Shin. 
Um, Shin, in your experience, uh, I think you have managed um, investment funds where you had also to integrate research innovator and whole ecosystem. Um, and I think it's interesting for us to hear your experience about uh, how do you see the prospect of technology in this post-COVID world in your own specific environment? And maybe if you can tap on your pers- on the personal experience of managing that investment fund, that would be great for us. Yes. Uh, this is Shin Ito. I'm calling from Tokyo. And uh, just to put things in perspective, I'd like to briefly describe what I've been doing. I started out as an engineer. Uh, in my career, and then after MBA, I managed businesses uh, in the U.S. for global businesses in technology. And then I moved to management consulting and uh, investment into venture businesses as well as intellectual property. And um, I would like to talk about uh, this you know, COVID-19 um, environment uh, technology development uh, from the perspective of open innovation. You know, uh, open innovation has been said and practiced for probably the last 15 years, uh, 20 years, and uh, it started in in the U.S. Uh, and a part of Europe. Now Japan is catching up for for the probably the past three four years. Um, Open innovation is an idea that uh, companies, particularly large companies, because uh, of the limitation of their research and development capabilities, they open up their problems and recruit new ideas from uh, others, like research institutes and uh, um, startup companies and so forth, and take in their technologies and ideas, right? Um, because of this COVID-19, um, it is very difficult uh, to connect and meet up with people. Now, you know, companies, employees are telecommuting most of the time uh, in large companies, particularly in, in Japan. And uh, it is good to contribute if the job or responsibilities are well defined so that you can deliver what you have and what you have produced. But in order to build up ideas, stimulating with each other is the difficult part. Uh, And that is the part that I think the world is going to miss uh, a lot. And now we have this telecommunication method like this uh, but we don't have a very good way to do whiteboarding and, you know, putting ideas down and build up ideas based on those uh, uh, things. So those are the, that is the limitation. And also these individual contributors uh, can contribute their ideas if there is a infrastructure built by and managed by somebody. And it can be by a large company, it can be by an expert institute. Uh, Such a scheme needs to uh, be well designed and uh, uh, create roles for individual contributors so that they can pitch in into those roles. And uh, this central Institute needs to coordinate and respect the contribution by uh, uh, protecting the intellectual properties and so forth. Um, Those are the sort of necessary uh, infrastructure for technology development. Um, And not only technology development, but also on all the way into commercialization that there are you know, certain ro- roles that need to take place you know, the, for the technology to grow and become a part of the society. Great. That's the initial Should, comment. Thank you very much for these initial comments. Um, extremely interesting uh, ideas that you do introduce the open innovation, which uh, 
also is uh, from a from a geopolitical perspective an opportunity for many countries to start participating more and more to a technology integration which is becoming um, somehow almost like a must have for countries to be able to compete especially considering the discontinuities that we're, we're experiencing right now technology can mitigate that um, so from from your experience will will st still be in the Asian cluster going to class now um, in from Shanghai again plus in the, the original briefing that we had when uh, you got in touch with me there was a very interesting um, way for you to describe that out of the I think 35,000 engineers that you have in at uh, at uh, SAP right SAP uh, most of them now are still in remote working and now after this extended period of time, some reflection will actually be made on the effectiveness of this, but also what you see maybe the implications. So your your contribution when I was um, reading it really take us into the relationship between technology, but also the future of remote working. And if you can share your perspective with us, that would be great. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. And uh... I can also relate very much to what uh, Harry and also Shin said from a China and also open innovation perspective, because that really links together because uh, the 35,000 engineers, which my role is actually to coordinate across uh, 20 different labs in 17 countries are now predominantly sitting at home. So it's a way it is an open innovation now because no, people can't come really together anymore in most countries. And that is a, unprecedented situation for, for a company like ours. And it has also pushed, of course, internally, and we can come to the external usage of SAP products later, uh, but internally, of course, it has pushed also the, the limits of the type of technology we are using, uh, new tools for collaboration, and so on. And But what we also, of course, um, we realized a few things over the last, meanwhile, six months. Yeah, Engagement level, you can keep up. I think that is possible. Yeah? If you if you manage the colleagues well, if you communicate a lot, you are able to to engage. But nevertheless, for many people, the stress levels increase. Yeah, so um, family situations, all of this is now mixed up with the daily job. That doesn't make it really so easy. And then in engineering and innovation in specific, right? Uh, you build a lot on collaboration, on mutual trust. Uh, sometimes speed matters. And here we see it's it's not that simple. Yeah, um, there are areas where we feel uh, if we would be able to meet, it would be much quicker, much better. Yeah, take knowledge transfer. Yeah, now you you include new people into a team. You have a reorganization. People then have not never met their boss. They have never met their peers. Uh, and here you are, and and now you are supposed to work as a team. Uh, from the beginning. That's that's not easy. And um, despite all the tools and also what we do here, uh, often um, the, the kind of um, social psychological factors also matter there a lot. So um, we try, of course, to, to overcome this. But on the other hand side, um, we are still indeed closed in some of the major locations, including the United States, including India, uh, whereas here in China, uh, we are all open and, and we test now here in China different new working models because I'm also sponsoring a project at SAP uh, working in the post-COVID world, uh, hoping that we reach this world at some point. Um, and therefore, we are trying to, to test these things out. So how can we organize teams if a certain number of people works from home, etc.? So this is currently where my thoughts are around. And then I'm happy to add later to the more digital uh, roadmaps here, which we also observe. Right. And the interesting part on this is, uh, um, Klaus, that you're bringing up a perspective that we could not really have at the beginning of the pandemic, because at the very beginning, we're celebrating the ability to uh, alternate the physical world to the digital one. We find it that is a way to salvage uh, our productivity to some extent. And we expand the opportunity now that technology makes it possible for us to be in different time zones and suddenly collaborate. Yeah. At the same time, uh, we start noticing then some unintended consequences are now revealing themselves to us. And maybe they will have an impact on productivity. So it's interesting, a perfect example where the a delay effect is now occurring 
that we need to actually take into account. And that's fascinating. Um, as I'm moving, thank you for this, and I'm, I'm moving to collect now the experience from uh, uh, Xiaohin. Um, and I also invite all the attendees uh, and what those watching, if you have any question for the time, we're going to be a much more uh, open format. Please type it into the chat and we'll try to take them. So let's go now to California. So we're going to go <laughs> in late evening and um, show in your perspective. Um, you have somehow facilitated um, also the existence of a moment like this uh, since you uh, are the CEO around the world. So tell us more from your perspective. Okay. Yeah. So uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, we can. Yeah. I cannot hear you. Oh, I can hear her. Oh yeah. I can. Yeah, yeah so, I can hear uh, you, class, but I cannot hear, for some reason, Xiaohin. So hi. I don't know if it's me. It must be me if you can hear. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, no, actually, sorry, Xiaohin, I don't hear. You hear me, right? Mm -hmm. You guys hear me fine. I cannot hear you. To me, it looks like there is a, a mute sign on the microphone. So I don't know how to... Um, um, Wait, let's try it again. Works. Okay. Uh, yeah, I probably, I'm not sure if it's my system or not, but I don't think so. I actually see all of you with, um, with actually a mute sign with exceptional class. Um, so. Yeah, maybe then centrally somebody has to mute me or, or we get all unmuted again. <laughs> you guys can all hear me okay, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, I can just start. So, hi, uh, I'm Xiaoyan. I'm the founder and CEO of Around the World. Uh, well, thank you so much for, first of all, uh, coming to Around the World for this event. Uh, we started the company uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, when we first launched, it was the week before COVID. Uh, that time, you know, online events was a new thing. I guess when we first launched, the, when we first started the company, people think it's a stupid idea because I'm uh, they are saying, hey, I'm flying to Vegas every year for some fun time and you're not depriving me from having those amazing times. <laughs> uh, and so it's very beginning, people don't trust the idea of online events because they don't believe that people can make relationships online. Uh, so when we first uh, launched the product, it was a week before COVID. Uh, and we kind of immediately see a lot of um, interest. Uh, the very beginning was probably March, April time. Uh, people were just trying to figure out a solution to move everything from offline world to online world. Uh, and the very easy thing was to kind of replicate exactly what you had uh, on off offline conferences and move it online and, and call it a day. Uh, uh, the thing that the, then we realized is that that format does not work. Uh, the format of having um, people just looking at webinars all day for, uh, you know, for eight hours every day um, and three whole days uh, doesn't work. Um, people don't really like to stay that long, especially if they don't get it interact with other people. We also see that the, the events, even though you, you invite the best speaker like Beyonce to come, uh, the monetization upside for people paying for those events also doesn't doesn't work. I mean, it's not the same as um, as watching Beyonce talking at you uh, in a Zoom webinar compared to actually meeting her in person. And the value that people can prioritize is just simply not the same. Um, so then we, we started to see a lot of changes in how do people approach events in general, where right now we see that the biggest value add is really uh, abilities to first interact with speakers on a two-way conversation where you know you're not just passively listening you can interact with other people uh, and the other value that people really see is the curated social experiences where you know that the people you're going to meet are sharing something in common with you and it's not going to be a waste of your time um and so uh the funny thing about the the online events format we see is that the introvert uh, are now more active uh, online than uh, than offline um, because when you go to a physical cocktail party if you're an introvert you better drink more because then you, you don't know what you're gonna say <laughs> you better carry more drinks uh, but it, when it's come to online so we have this format you guys probably tried an online cocktail party what we find is that because it's all only five minutes uh, and it's just matching to you uh, so you don't kind of you don't feel like you're being judged which is really important uh, we see that if you don't get 
it, it, the, the, the Tinder way doesn't really work on the online events world because if you get rejected twice, uh, you just kind of lost interest or lost, um, you know, confidence or whatever. Um, that you just don't want to engage anymore. Uh, so we're kind of designing new formats to say, hey, what is the right format for introverts to not feel like they're uh, being judged all the time and, and helps them figure out the right first sentence to say. Um, so those are kind of the, some of the new opportunity we see. And obviously, the other part about the remote is that our company used to have an office. Uh, it was a, a team of seven um, and then a team of 10 around six months ago, a team of seven, maybe eight months ago. Uh, we, you used to have an office, uh, but then uh, we, our company has grown quite a bit. So now we have almost 50 people uh, and most of the people I've never met. Uh, and so we kind of start hiring in Asia and the U.S., uh, they will realize, you know, it doesn't really make sense in an office anymore. Uh, it's an office for seven people. Most of the people are not going to be in the office. And uh, it's just kind of awkward. So we actually decided to shut down our office physically and just make it entirely remote. Um, and obviously, there's new challenges to that. And we have a team in Asia who don't speak English very well. So there's a lot of uh, cultural barriers that, that we're starting to see. Uh, and, and But the problem is that, uh, so, so but the thing is that like now everybody is remote. We, we're just trying to figure out um, how to bridge the gap. Um, so we're trying to run some cocktail party internally to see if we can break the ice. Uh, but it's, it's still a work in progress. And I'm really curious to hear your guys' thoughts on how do you make your team come together um, despite being remote? Wow. Um, now I, I was able to hear you, Xiaohin, which is great. <laughs> That's I, great. I felt actually I was not included into the, this party, right? Exactly um, what you were sharing in terms of inclusion. But what I think is extremely interesting and is, is almost uh, uh, providing uh, uh, a different perspective from what Klaus was sharing is that if you're starting from a physical world migrating to the digital, you sort of like pay a price for that adaptation because you have a reminiscence of the physical world, especially if you know people in, in real life. Uh, in your case, you started to expand your team and many of them never met ever. And the interesting story, like you are a digitally native in that perspective. So maybe what we can discuss later is whether you think that the setup uh, in like digital uh, native or becoming digital by, by circumstances might have a different impact on the, uh, on the evolution of the platform. This is fascinating. And, and so from this, to make sure that we are, we're closing the loop around the contribution, we're going right in the middle of the night. Uh, so in uh, Elflana and Andrew, um, you have heard, you know, different contributions. Um, as the final round from your side, uh, what we would like to add sure. and your experience in this, uh, you know, it's like COVID and post COVID uh, sure, sure. moments. All this pressure. Um, so here we are in Atlanta and, I mean, Atlanta's in Georgia, Florida's right next to us. We're still in the middle of COVID. Uh, cases are increasing. Um, at the same time, our government has decided it doesn't exist. So everything's just opening. And, um, so we're going to keep seeing the cases. It's, it's, it's kind of weird, but, um, but you know, there's a lot of weird stuff happening in our, in our country right now, of course. But, um, I'm, I'm the co-founder and CEO of safely.com. And in our mission is to help a homeowner feel comfortable with this internet stranger coming into their house through Airbnb, through booking.com and VRBO. So we have the right data, the right analytics, and then the right um, insurance policy. So if anything goes wrong during one of these rentals, we take care of it. And so we've seen a really, um, a really interesting trend in terms of working. And that is a lot of people are, you, they, they don't have to go to the office anymore and their kids don't have to go to school. So we're seeing this summer just continue. The summer high season is just continuing. Our All of our homes are at 100% occupancy still. Normally we drop off to about 40% occupancy right now, but people are still going because they can pack up the kids. Oh, and by the way, remember I mentioned there's some crazy people in the urban areas. Well, you want to get away from that too. So people are getting away from the cities, going at, you know, going into a private home. Um, these homes are replacing hotels and of course, cruise ships for sure. But, but travel accommodation, um, you want to stay in a private home instead of going into a hotel with these big shared spaces where you have to talk to someone at the front desk. Instead, you go into this house you bring your Lysol and your gloves and you spend the first hour and a half cleaning and then you shut the door. No one can come in and you stay for the week and, and you're safe and it is the right way to stay right now. And we're seeing just, um, you know, a lot 
of new homes entering the market because it, you know there's it, you, these homeowners can monetize their their home, um, but also we're just seeing a lot more people staying. We're supposed to be going into a low season, and it's just continuing. Um, you were a hundred like this month will will be a hundred fifty percent more book nights than we were the same month September of last year. So so really really strong growth at a time when hotels are you know, down forty percent year over year. So that's what we're seeing in terms of you know our industry short term home rentals, but we're now calling it the the travel accommodation industry. And, and in terms of our team, we're a team of 10, so really small. Uh, you know, insurance is a very scalable product. So, you know, we covered $36 billion of homeowner liability since we launched in 2015, but we still just have a team of 10. So far, we all know each other still, you know, from the live days. And so um, you know, working remotely hasn't been a problem, um, but we did give up our office. We, were, we had a flexible lease, so we were able to give it up. Um, what I want to do once things calm down a little bit is have one day where we we spend together. But I'm seeing a lot more productivity from the team, and I'm seeing um, just a lot more happiness because people are able to, you know, two of us on the in the company have a newborn, so you're able to spend some time with the baby you know, during during um, the day, and then go back to work. Um, and 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 I've also seen that introvert. You that what, what you mentioned is that introverts are are contributing a lot more than ever because we're a lot more equal, you know, on the on the digital channels on Zoom or on video, and and so I have two team members who are just really stepping up and performing. Uh, I mean, they've always been performing, but but they're a lot more vocal and playing a, a much greater leadership role. So so that's what we're seeing here. Fascinating. I I find that. This, uh, this experience that you're sharing with us fascinating because I guess, and this is a, a perception I have, and, and I think we all are perceiving it through your experiences, is really a new rising paradigm uh, that is becoming much more concrete. I think in the very first stages, uh, we were trying to wonder how solid this new paradigm could have been. And now we're realizing that more than a paradigm is becoming a quite strong platform. And the fact that, you know, one speaker after the other in the case of, of, uh, of Shaohin and Andrew, you share a very similar story in two different parts of the country in which you actually decided to give away the physical office to mainly go fully digital. That's a quite uh, interesting step that might have not happened with such a scale before COVID, right? So this is under something interesting for us to, to look at. Uh, this is the time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, where we can maybe spend the remainder of the time, we've got about 13 minutes, um, to have maybe a conversation on, on some follow-ups. And that's also where I'm asking the attendees if they wish to type question in the chat that we can try to address. Uh, and while we're waiting for that questions to come, um, I'm actually intrigued, and I go to you, Harry, for a moment, <clears throat> because um, you somehow presented a China that was going back to some form of normal. You have spoken about an acceleration, um, but you also spoken about the sense of reinstating some form of normal habits about going back to work. And you mentioned things are reopening. It's a sense that we went through a storm, so to say, and now we're regaining our space on the streets. Um, but at, towards the end of the contribution, we started to notice a world that might not go back to normal, in that sense. Did you perceive the same also in China? Did you perceive the new business model that were shifting from physical to digital were there to stay? Or did you find that China had more desire to go back to a territorial experience of the world? Uh, so I guess, uh, I guess we, we have a belief or we have observed that uh, technology adoption uh, access to data has really uh, been higher in China um, uh, over the last uh, 10, 20 years, particularly with the advance and advent of a uh, mobile internet. And so to that mm -hmm. end, I think uh, the consumer experience, the 2C segment of the economy has really broadly pushed 
technology to the forefront. So many of the experiences that have accelerated during the COVID were many of the trends that had already been in place prior, but they just gotten much faster. So the question we keep asking is, uh, what does the future look like? Does the future look more virtual or more human or a blend of both? And, um, and so I think what we're seeing and finding is that people are finding a equilibrium that works for them. It'll be a combination of more technology, more online mm -hmm. experiences, but higher quality human experiences. So what do I mean by that? I think we're finding that people are going to do online healthcare. They're going to do telemedicine. The kids are going to go to and do um, um, uh, online education. Autonomous driving and delivery is going to accelerate. And uh, that's going to free their time up to do many of the other things that they like to do in human terms. And so I personally feel that uh, after this is all over, there's going to be an explosion of hedonistic consumption in China, mm -hmm. where people are just going to want to come back together and party and get together and spend. But then when the dust all settles, they're going to find that technology is a really good enabler for them to free up the time to do the things that they want to do more of and leave the things that they don't want to do more of to the technology. So that that's yeah. very interesting. Harry. <laughs> and maybe that brings me a linkage to uh, Sheen, the, who is in Japan. And Sheen, a question that I've been having since some time is that Japan is a country that has been uh, somehow more advanced in building a rapport with technology uh, in comparison to other countries, you know. Uh, we all studied the fact that the innovation in Japan was almost second skin uh, for Japanese. And also, we we also look at the degree of technology breakthrough that were coming in Japan, different from other countries where they might have served an external market. They were instead serving the Japanese community first. So many of those innovations, they serve the community first and then they scale outside. So you heard about almost like a world that wakes up and discover uh, how technology can change our life. But in the perspective of someone who is currently in Tokyo, did you find the same acceleration towards the discovery technology and a little bit less, uh, um, less let's say, um, caught by surprise by the events of the last few uh, months? I think that uh, it used to be, uh, Japan used to be much more advanced in technology, in technology development. And uh, I think that, I feel uh, that uh, Japan has sort of lost its edge uh, in some of the areas. And uh, digitization, digital data treatment and management uh, has been behind compared with other countries and areas. Uh, that is why, for example, I, I give you an example that we are counting the number of incidents uh, of COVID-19 and there have been delays in the counts um, within Tokyo, three, four days sometimes. Do you know why? because these uh, hospitals and government institutes and so forth, they are exchanging numbers of patients via fax. And uh, there, there have been loss of papers and loss of counts and so forth. And this is totally out of date. And uh, we realize that this needs to, to uh, much uh, improved. And there are cases like this um, in not only in this incident, but uh, uh, in other areas. The government is really behind. That is why uh, the new Prime Minister Suga is instituting a new digital uh, ministry or agency and to trying to catch up. Fascinating. I mean, and I think we're learning a lot just from the experience that you're sharing with us. And, and that brings me to... Um, class, back to you, because of the panel, you represent the larger entity, right, with thousands of employees. Um, and one, on one side, it's interesting to hear the story coming up, although they're now a company, they're moving into, into some form of scale up. And that form of, of enthusiasm about integrating technology is an opportunity to Um, about
about uh, safely and, and run the world, but not too much in large entity or conversations where you get new ideas and new inspirations and if everybody just doing his or her job at home very perfectly basically of, of everyone yeah so basically the sum of everything should or the whole should be more than the sum we in a larger engineering uh, organization of course are always striving to achieve. And here mm -hmm. I see indeed that um, this suffers to some extent after many months. Yeah? And as I said, think about you join, um, you join the team of Xiaoyin, uh, but usually if Xiaoyin would just sit on the other side of the table, so much more of communication would happen like, hey, how do you do this? Oh yeah, thank you. And, and you can clarify so many questions just in a Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I feel it's a little bit, how can I say, uh, if a very experienced person, right, sits at home and says, I know my job, I'm a software architect, I know it all, I can do it from here, this may be right, but what about the others, why don't you share your knowledge anymore, <laughs> so I think we need to take a good balance, and this is what we want to achieve, and, and to, to Harry's remark, I 100% I agree, the digital models that bring real value to the people will stay. They will definitely stay. And we will mm -hmm. see much more of this. Education, I have my doubts. Because mm -hmm. the online education, the teachers hate it, the, the kids hate it, and the parents hate it. So I think there is no value there <laughs> for anyone. <laughs> and the biggest day in Shanghai was 10th of May when the schools reopened, I tell you. <laughs> you know, I, I find this uh, fascinating what you share, Klaus, because it's the same idea would we use technology to check in for a flight and have our own boarding pass? The answer is, of course, is a no-brainer, but we still like to physically line up and get checked in in a hotel. And you could say the same could happen, but why don't we do this? Yeah, I, I told the platform not to kick you out, so it won't kick you out. progression happening coffee breaks right or lunch and see this playing a role in a in Right now, if I don't travel, if I don't come here physically, I don't believe that we need to choose one or the other. I do think that online. So, uh, Andrew, yeah, and then I'm, I'm
is what's distracting. Um, but I do find that That's great. That means audience member are taking it too. Yeah. Really? I would feel nine people are doing it. I feel like I cannot interrupt. collective moment because we've been um then uh, Shaohin and Andrew thank you so much for joining day afternoon or the uh, face to face uh, you know, and, and, and experience the reality also as, as people, but this was a great start and I hope to best and we close the session. Thank you for all the attendees, all the